to Catholic Answers Live, the program where you participate with your questions about apologetics and evangelization, including the most important theological, spiritual, moral, and social issues facing the world today. Call now with your question for today's guest. Toll free, 1-888-31-TRUTH. That's 888-318-7884. Now, from San Diego, Catholic Answers Live. Welcome to our Thursday Q&A Open Forum on Catholic Answers Live. My name is Patrick Coffin. Welcome back to the show. If it's the first time you've ever heard the show, we exist to explain and defend and promote and clarify and make better loved uh, the teaching of Jesus Christ, the person of Christ and the church he founded. We're into the both and principle, Christ and the church, faith and reason, and uh, faith and works, as a matter of fact. And in the second hour of this Q&A open forum, our guest will be our staff apologist and writer, Jim Blackburn. He's got a great book on divorce annulments and uh, Catholic teaching on marriage. And he'll be here in the second hour. The toll-free phone number is one 318 7884 truth We turn now to our first guest of our first hour. He's here. He is uh, prepared fully. He's read up. He's prayed up. He is in full battle array, and his name is Jimmy Aiken. And hello, Jimmy. Howdy, Patrick. How are you doing? I am pretty good. Good. TGIT. TGIT. Mm-hmm. Indeed, yeah. You said it looked like Steve Jobs, because I have a sort of a, a black, mm, what's it called, a non-turtleneck it's sweater. Not a, sweater. It's not a turtleneck sure. sweater, but mm-hmm. it's a, you're wearing a, a dark you know sweater and dark pants, and, and you got that dark hair, mm-hmm. and so... Uh, you know, but but I don't have the the five bazillion dollar idea, and, no. the, and the business prowess to do, carry it out. If you do, let me out. know what it is. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll share that with you, Jimmy. Have you ever constructed an empire of lies? No. Okay. Uh, well, you, we expect you to reply that way. Well, I would anyway, wouldn't I? Well, Got to protect your empire of lies. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Speaking of uh, of empire, our our audience is expanding at all times, and we've got callers on the line waiting right now. Want to go to them? After you explain to me mm-hmm. what the Empire of Lies reference is a reference to. I was just to. trying to catch you up. Oh, okay. Because I knew you'd probably say no, and because we didn't pre-rehearse this and never do. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I would uh, pull your chain just a little bit. Okay. Well, Around the edges. In, in, in that case, you know, Mamu dog face to the banana patch. Well, um, they have medication for that. Steve Martin reference there. Okay. I mean, you could yeah. you could have said it forward instead of backwards. It would have been more helpful. <laughs> Even though I did see the movie The Exorcist, I'm, I'm not fluent uh, well, in that's, backwards that's, English. That's, that's his, his uh, depiction of what happens if you just, just for fun, you know, you got a small child and learning mm-hmm. English and you talk wrong around the child. Mm, that's what happens. Yeah. I figured out how to speak Russian. Uh huh. Yeah. Now you're a bit of a linguist yourself. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've studied Russian or any of the Cyrillic languages. I know but only a few words. Tovarich. Well, Russian is actually English backwards. Uh huh. It sounds very similar, doesn't it? Nostrovia, vodka, <laughs> Lenin. Yeah. Something. Oh, Matt. Matt, our oh. our uh, just our we're, we're getting super, a piece of information. Our, our super adequate sound engineer, Matt, says Nostrovia is also Polish, which it probably could be. Since and how um, would you know that, Mister Tuchinsky? Tuchinsky is <laughs> isn't that like a, a venerable North Korean uh, name? No. SKI is <laughs> Polish and SKY is Russian, right? I think that's the breakdown. Uh-huh. All right. Well, we've got folks want to have their Catholic questions answered live here on Catholic Answers Live. Let's start with Douglas in Tampa, Florida on 98.5 FM. Hello, Douglas. Hey, gentlemen. May I ask uh, two questions? Would that be all right? Well, let's see if the first one is like war and peace. No. <laughs> if it's closer to one word answer, probably. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, Hail full of grace. Mm-hmm. Whose words are those? Well, the way the Gospel of Luke presents them, they are the words of the angel Gabriel when he addresses Mary at the Annunciation. Uh, right, but aren't they actually our Lord's words? Do, mm. Well, the, the angel is a the angel is a messenger, correct? Yeah, and even and I mean, it would seem to me our Lord gave angel those words to say to her wouldn't that make 
Well, Is that not right? That's that's a matter. I guess people could have different opinions on the particular way in which God, uh, you know, has his messages communicated by the angels. It's true. The angels are the messengers of God. In fact, that's what the word angelos means in Greek is messenger. And so, yeah, the certainly the gist of what they convey to someone is something that God has sent them to convey. Whether he's allowed them any liberty in how they phrase it uh, is something that uh, that I suppose we really don't know. Why that doesn't seem to be clearly revealed in the deposit of Revelation. Um, certainly, because he uh, what he says is accurate. You know, Mary has been uniquely graced by God. That's something that God did, and so that's some something that you could certainly say God's intentionality is behind. Whether it was left up to the will of the angel to phrase it exactly this way or whether God said, hey, I want you to use these exact words. That's something mm-hmm. I suppose people could have different opinions on. In the same right. way that what? Douglas, Douglas, you placed the call, right, today? Right. Not God didn't, and yet God made well, you. <laughs> I get it. But <laughs> okay. my, my, See, my point is many times Protestants, um, when they hear me say hail full of grace, hail Mary full of grace, they misunderstand that as me worshiping Mary. But I started thinking about it, and I said, well, whose words are those, hail full of grace? I think they're our Lord's words, and if our Lord can say hail well, full of grace or give, the, or give the message to the messenger, which is the angel, Mm. say something like, hail full of grace, why can't I? Yeah, well, I wouldn't look at it necessarily in terms of God demanded that these particular words for sure got used on this occasion, but I would I would say it's enough to simply say these words are true. And, and recorded in God's and Word. And recorded in God's Word, and God definitely was the one who chose to record them. So, uh, so regardless of whether on that particular occasion God gave a specific mandate for those words, they're true, right. and God chose to preserve them in Scripture. That's my bigger point. It wasn't so much the, uh, you know, the literalness, I guess, of it all, but you, you basically, I think, made my point. Good. Certainly the God's intention. Yeah. Is, exactly. Is carried by the angel. Yeah. Hence, messenger. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, um, we're, we're up against a soft break, Douglas, okay. but I think we may have time for a second one. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm just learning about the Mass and that type of thing, but... Um, when the priest says during Mass, let us call to mind our sins, mm-hmm. what is the Church's teaching on that? Is it to call our, to mind our sins of the past week or the past five years or... What is the uh, what are the actual church teachings? On that? It's not so much a church teaching as a discipline to help prepare us for mass to remember that we are sinful creatures and that we are in need of God's grace. There's not a particular set of sins that the church expects one to to call to mind in this situation. Um, if you've committed you know any mortal sin since your last confession, those would be logical ones to think about. Uh, but even if you haven't, even if you just walked out of confession and haven't sinned in any way right. since then, you could still right. just think back about the fact that, you know, I have committed sins in the past and I need to be on my guard against those and I need to depend on God's grace to forgive me when I do sin and to help me overcome sin. And the venial ones you call to mind are forgiven at Mass. Yes. Okay, right. How's that, Douglas? You got a twofer there. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you very right. much. Excellent, uh, as always. Thank you, keep Douglas. Good work. We've decided right. to keep Jimmy. We were going to sell him for medical <laughs> experiments, but... Yeah, I yeah. call him Robo-Jimmy. <laughs> okay. Like uh, Robo-Cop, you know? Robo yeah, Jimmy. well, Robo-Apologist, I think, is... Robo-Catholic uh, is Robo what hmm. Jerry, Jesse Romero and... Ken Hensley have called me. Robo Actually, you're both uh, Hmm. fantastic, so I really appreciate your show. Well, without callers, we don't have much of a show, Douglas, so thanks for your your input. God bless you, sir. Take care. All right, you too. Nine after the hour, it's Catholic Answers Live. Our guest is the author of Mass Revision, How the Liturgy is Changing and What It Means for You. Uh, Also, I'd recommend his book. Um, It's on the Church Fathers. It's called The Fathers Know Best, all, all of which are available at Catholic.com or by our order lo- order number, which is 888 888 That's our order line. I'm Patrick Coffin. This show will return after these words. Touching that dial, not recommended. They don't call Jimmy Robo-Catholic for nothing. Call now and let him answer your question. 
We suppose it's possible for a new sweater or a soccer ball or even an aquarium to help someone grow closer to God. But let's face it, a great Catholic book, audio set, DVD, or other faith resource is almost certain to be more effective. That's why Catholic Answers is once again offering everything in our vast store at 10 to 25% off, and in some cases, even more through the end of the year. Log on today to Catholic.com or phone 888-291-8000 for complete details and information about what's available. There's nothing wrong with giving gifts that will help people you know simply enjoy life more. But the most important thing you can do is help them get to heaven. It's with that in mind that we have again marked down everything we sell by 10 to 25% or more during our annual sale. Hurry and grab terrific resources from the best thinkers, apologists, and speakers in the church today and save a bundle in the process. Call 888-291-8000 or log on to Catholic.com. The Catholic Answers Minute. I'm Father Vincent Serpa. In Luke 13, 34, Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, How many times I yearned to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing, but you were unwilling. How long has it been since you last thought of the God of the universe yearning for you? What he said of the people of Jerusalem, he could easily say of us. Like those people of old, we tend not to take the Lord's expression of love seriously. Could it be that we doubt his love for us because we don't consider ourselves to be all that lovable? This is certainly inevitable if we measure ourselves by only our shortcomings and limitations, which most of us do. What we fail to realize is that He makes us lovable simply by loving us. He is God after all. We all need to look at the crucifix more often, and then again, and then again. I'm Father Vincent Serpa for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. Call now with your question, 888-318-7884. This is Catholic Answers Live. Yes, indeed. Hour 2 will feature Jim Blackburn sitting in this seat, now occupied by Jimmy Aiken, our robo-Catholic apologist, author of Mass Revision, How the Liturgy is Changing and What It Means for You. 888-31-TRUTH is the toll-free phone number, and we're going to go to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, listening on Annunciation Radio. It's Lenny. Hello, Lenny. You're on the air, sir. Hello. Hey, go ahead, Lenny. Hi. Good evening, gentlemen. How are you? I'm good. Good. Um, my question is this. I'm a uh, confirmation catechist, and the topic we were discussing was the rosary, and we were reflecting on the mystery of Jesus being found in the temple and uh, as a child. Mm-hmm. And the question was posed, was it wrong for Jesus to have left uh, Mary and Joseph and go to the temple. Good, good question, Lenny. Mary, okay. Mary wasn't fully enthused about it. <laughs> well, we can <laughs> we can say with certainty that because Jesus was sinless, uh, that he, he did not sin in so doing. And so, while it certainly can be sinful for children to wander away from their parents, uh, that's not what happened in this case. There can also be legitimate reasons why someone may uh, leave the presence of their parents, and presumably whatever reason uh, Jesus had for, you know, when the rest of the caravan left uh, for staying behind, it was a good one. So we can infer that just from first principles. It also should be pointed out that um, uh, that this situation isn't presented in Scripture as Jesus was disobeying them. It, it, it They also, you know, they assumed, they made an assumption that he was with them, and it turned out that was wrong. So it, it seems, if anything, to be presented as an innocent misunderstanding. And Luke is c- very clear about the fact that Jesus was not a disobedient child because after they find him at the temple, it makes the point Luke's gospel does. It makes the point explicitly that he uh, he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. So Luke mm. is quite concerned uh, in recounting the incident to make sure we understand that this wasn't an act of disobedience or rebellion on Jesus's part. Right. Okay. I, yeah, and I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I what I was presenting to them was that, no, he was... That was not a sin, what he did. 
the, the counter that they came back with was then why is the next line that he returned and was obedient to them? I would say it's because it, it it's, almost it's makes loose. the implication yeah. that yeah. Um, he was. I think it, I think I think it's the opposite. I think that it's making the point that he had an obedient character, and that mm-hmm. we shouldn't read this as an act of disobedience or rebellion. One of an ancillary theme might be that Mary's not a goddess, so we can't worship her because she didn't. She doesn't know kind of everything. Upset. Yeah, right. Right. Why'd you do this to us? Basically, Lenny gave up the good work in Oklahoma City. Thank you for the call. It is sixteen after the hour. We'll go to Aaron now in Albuquerque, New Mexico, on our wonderful partner, Immaculate Heart Radio in Albuquerque. Hello, Aaron. You're on the air. Hello, gentlemen. Welcome. Welcome. I have a question today. My my. Um, well, I guess I'm a first time caller. Uh, my question today is uh, in terms of med- medical marijuana. I am an Iraqi war veteran, diagnosed with 100% post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. I was uh, wondering if I would be under the pain of sin if I was to seek relief using this type of medicine. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your service uh, to our country and and to the Iraqi people. Um, I also want to extend my condolences on your condition. I I know that's something that's very difficult to live with, and I hope that, uh, that in time it'll get better and that uh, you won't have to carry that burden anymore. Um, in terms of the specific question about medical marijuana, I, I am not an expert on, uh, on potential therapeutic benefits for marijuana, and consequently I can't really speak to that. What I can do is uh, talk about general principles, and it's obvious that marijuana is a mind-altering substance uh, that – is claimed to be able to provide relief for certain conditions. And in that respect, it is not dissimilar to other mind-altering substances that also can provide or claim to provide relief from particular conditions like codeine or uh, other uh, controlled pharmaceutical substances. And so if, if in a particular case... Um, the use of a particular substance does have therapeutic benefit, and if even though it, it's mind altering in some way, like codeine or or morphine or or any number of of similar substances, um, if it has actual therapeutic benefit that is proportionate. Uh, to the potential harm in using the substance, then it can, in principle, be morally legitimate. But um, in the case of medical marijuana, it's obviously a very controversial subject, and you have people expressing different opinions about it. And because I'm not an expert, I can't really address medical marijuana in particular. All I can say is that substances that have legitimate, proportionate therapeutic value to the problems they cause, such as the way they alter mental function, can be used in principle, but that's a determination that has to be made by competent experts, such as doctors, and so I can't answer that myself. Okay. Aaron, you, might, right. you, might, you might find some answers in our, at our forums at catholic.com. Someone may okay. need something similar. Um, I, I hope that's a help, that Aaron, out. and I echo Jimmy's words, and we will keep you in our prayers at Holy Mass tomorrow morning, Aaron. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd okay, also brother. say very definitely talk to a normal doctor because there may be other treatments that that might be more effective potentially. Yeah, abnormal doctors yeah. not recommended. I should yeah. I should talk to my priest really because I've been through a number of other treatments that haven't been very effective mm-hmm. in yeah. terms of uh, antidepressants and uh, those types of drugs. Oh. yep, couldn't hurt. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you very Aaron. much, guys. God bless you. Thanks for the call. Right. Just to clarify for our listeners, you also are not an expert on the merits of recreational use of marijuana mm, either. Because right? I'm, I'm you did some medical. I just wanted to. Right. I'm not an expert on that either. Full, full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's 19 after the hour. My name is Patrick Coffin. Our guest's name is Jimmy Aiken. Our next caller's name is Mike. He's in Indiana listening on EWTN Sirius Satellite Radio. Hello, Mike. You're on the air, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, m- my question is, uh, my wife and I recently had our uh, third child about a month ago. Congratulations. And, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. It's a, it really is a miracle. Uh, we had two, and then uh, she had three miscarriages, and then, uh, mm. oh. you know, by a miracle of God's grace, uh, you know, we had another child. Praise and, God. But my question is, is now, you know, she 
wants to get her tubes tied, and of course I'm against it 100. percent But uh, she's gone so far as even to make an appointment, oh. and it's coming up, you know, within three weeks. And you know, I, you know, I basically have said, you know, I'm not, I can't take you to the appointment. I don't want anything to do with this. And mm-hmm. of course now that's threatening, uh, you know, right? Status quo in the marriage and all that sort of stuff. And I just, uh, I'm not sure. <clears throat> what the right answer is uh, to do and all that other stuff for, in regards to, uh, you know, the church and uh, teaching I think and all that kind of stuff. I think Jimmy's got a good handle yeah. on it. Well, I, I want to say that, that you're right in terms of, of opposing this procedure because um, one cannot uh, undertake any action before, during, or after the marital act that would deliberately render it infertile. And this right. is something that's being done in anticipation of future marital acts to render them infertile. And so this is something that would not fall within the bounds of Catholic teaching. In fact, it's, it would, the church would regard it as gravely sinful. And so your opposition to that is fully warranted. In terms of how to approach the situation, that's something that um, is something that you know, you know your wife, I don't, so take my advice for what it's worth, but here are a couple things to think about. One of them is I would try to express things as lovingly as possible. Uh, I, I would try not to come off as demanding. I would say, honey, I love you. I love our children. I understand fully the fact that we may not be in a position where we should have any more, but I want to make sure that we do things the right way. And if nothing else, could we at least wait on this uh, and right. and think about it uh, and study about it and pray about it and try to be open, you know, to different viewpoints on this and see what the church says? I don't know how much study she's been able to do with that. Um, one thing that I would recommend is material that's put out by a ministry called One More Soul uh, uh-huh. and uh, in particular the moral theologian Janet Smith. And some of that material may be of use. It may be stuff that she'd be willing to read or watch or listen to. And, um, and I would say, you know, keep the, uh, keep the matter in prayer. Um, also, uh, Patrick, you have something on this subject as well, don't you? Mike, I have a whole chapter in my book, Sex on Naturel, called Planned Barrenhood. And I treat the issue of, of vasectomy and tubal ligation separately because it's, it represents a kind of a delicate pastoral challenge um if your wife's if she's open to reading it i think it'd be very helpful just so she gets both sides of the fact list um i don't know how much knowledge your wife has about the effectiveness of natural family planning either that might also be yeah in play yeah it was brought up once in a conversation a couple of years ago but uh, you know it sort of i think she i don't know just dismissed it and you know i don't know i guess i could try to bring it up again mm-hmm. uh but if you could tell me where to get a hold of your uh well it's uh, uh, how catholic.com it has it okay. uh yeah it's i i make re- some reference to it on my blog patrickhoffman.net you can call but, our order uh, line yeah order line is uh triple uh triple eight two nine one eight thousand sexo natural it's called and uh and okay. yeah mm-hmm. all is a u right yeah oh is a u yeah, yeah. sex all natural and uh, so I would say just, you know, be gentle and uh, in talking about it. And, and right now, since she's already set an appointment, I would my, my immediate goal would be to try to say, can we just wait on this and devote some further yeah. study and thought to it? At least delay it because okay. tubal ligation is almost forever. Yeah. Exceptionally difficult to uh, reverse that one. Okay. All right, uh, Mike. Yeah, cause I'm just worried that it's going to, you know, if this happens and I, I don't know, you know. Well, one, it's one, not going to be good. Yeah. You know, one step at a time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Michael. God bless you. All right. Thanks, and gentlemen. God will okay. give you both the grace you need to deal with things as they happen. Uh, yeah, I know it will, and I appreciate that. God bless you guys. Take care. Yeah. 24 after the hour, Catholic Answers Live goes to Rodney in Niagara Falls, Ontario, listening on EWTN, Sirius Satellite Radio Canada. Hey, Rodney. Hi, how are you? Good. Love Niagara Falls. Oh, thank you. It's... Uh, it's kind of chilly down here now. Mm, mm. Sorry to hear. Last Wait, night it was uh, bit, ooh, ooh, it was like high 50s. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Rodney. <laughs> Go ahead. How can Jimmy help you? My question is I've been hearing some some talk from people and friends of mine about that Jesus Christ was not born on December 25th. Mm-hmm. Is this true? 
Well, we don't know for sure exactly when he was born. Could have been. Um, you know, I mean, it, there have been some arguments that have been advanced to try to, to argue that he wasn't, but those arguments themselves aren't that uh, aren't that great. For example, uh, it talks about in Luke's gospel about how there were shepherds pasturing their flocks when Jesus was born. And some people have said, oh, well, it was too cold to pasture flocks at that time of year. So therefore, um, he must not have been born in December. Well, Sorry, no. They actually pasture their flocks right now in December in Israel, and they, you know, it's not like they had a big sheep barn they would use only in the winter time and bring them inside the big sheep <laughs> barn. So, uh, so, so that's not a really good argument. Um, it, other people have said, well, it was in, it was an attempt to subvert a pagan holiday. But the problem is we don't have. Um, evidence of pagans celebrating that holiday is Saul Invictus, the unconquerable son. We don't have evidence of them celebrating Saul Invictus on December 25th earlier than, uh, than Christians were celebrating Christ. So there doesn't seem to be a connection there. What I can say is those early church writers who advocate December 25th say that he was born December 25th because that's when they believe he was born. And they were closer to the events than we are. Indeed. Rodney in Niagara Falls. Hope that's a help, sir. Thank you. Every other question. Oh, got to wait to the break, Rodney. Catholic Answers Live returns after these messages. Stick around. Get to Rodney's question and yours. Be right back. For decades, Catholic.com has been the most trusted Catholic apologetics and evangelization website on the Internet. You've used it to get answers to your questions, listen to Catholic Answers Live, interact with an apologist, get to our discussion forums, purchase great resources, and so much more. Well, if you haven't been to our site lately, you've got to check it out because it's all new and easier than ever to find what you're looking for, no matter what that may be. Log on today to Catholic.com and see for yourself. Now you'll find nine tiles on the homepage which take you to major current items we want to bring to your attention. The new menu bar directs you to all of our significant departments. There's even a search bar at the top of the homepage for your convenience. This is just the first of several forthcoming updates to Catholic.com. Stop by today, watch the introductory video, and see what's new. The pressure on our daughters today to look the part or to fit in is tremendous. As a former America's Next Top Model, Catholic Answers Leah Darrow has devoted herself to speaking to crowds of high school girls across the country. Leah's journey in faith has been a battle at times, but has left her with a refreshed and hopeful perspective on the world. I felt loved. I really felt loved. And that was huge. I had never really felt that way in those terms before. Full, encompassing love. And that I really was forgiven. It all went away. Phone 619-387-7200 to schedule a talk at your high school by the dynamic and inspiring Leah Darrow. She shares how modesty inspired others to look at her and treat her differently than before. Phone 619-387-7200 and let Leah Darrow inspire the young women in your community, including the ones you love. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. My name is Jimmy Aiken, and uh, we're going to be taking your calls again in just a second. But before we do, I want to let you know about uh, an event that we have coming up. It's going to be next May. Uh, Catholic Answers is having its cruise. It's going to be uh, leaving from Rome and traveling all the way around the, I guess, the western coast of Europe. It's going to go to a bunch of fascinating places, including Fatima. Uh, that's right. Uh, even though, of course, Fatima's inland and there's not a port there, there's going to be a port fall in Lisbon and there's going to be a road trip to uh, to Fatima. And there's going to be also a pre-event in Rome. So if you've never been to Rome or even if you have, you can go and see a lot of stuff. This would make an excellent Christmas present for you or for other members of your family. So if you'd like to get more information about that, uh, just go by CatholicAnswersCruise.com. Once again, that's CatholicAnswersCruise.com, and they've got all the information there about it, including the speakers. And among the speakers are going to be the gentleman sitting to my right, Patrick Coffin. Thanks for that live 
add a uh, reminder to poke folks, Jimmy. Um, yeah, CatholicAnswersCruise.com uh, or 800-707-1634. The Rome pre-cruise event is optional, but it does include a uh, scheduled reception with uh, two cardinals, possibly three, and maybe some secret surprise guests we shall see but i'm looking forward to it we set sail on the uh, 10th of may 2010 and would love to have you join us triple eight thirty one truth is the toll-free number and before the break we were speaking with rodney in niagara falls rodney you had another question sir yes thank you thank you very much for uh for for answering that first question and clearing that up and kind of understand that a bit more um another question i had was with the sabbath day being sunday i mean i always celebrated um, Sunday as a Sabbath day, but now I'm hearing that possibly Saturday might have been a Sabbath day. Is that true? Well, the in the Old Testament, the Sabbath day is Saturday. Now, they at different periods in uh, in Jewish history reckoned the beginning of that at different times. These days, it's customary for Jewish people to recognize the beginning of the Sabbath as occurring on what we would call Friday night, and then it runs through Saturday night. Uh, because not everybody historically has has marked the beginning of the day at midnight the way we do. There have been different uh, ways it's been done throughout history. Um, in Christian circles, it's uh, it is common to refer to Sunday as the Sabbath because it plays an analogous function for us. It's the day of rest and worship, and so uh, you will commonly find that usage. Um, in the Bible, though, when the word Sabbath gets used, it's a reference to the uh, to the Jewish Sabbath. Wow. So the term has cool. kind of expanded its meaning and changed a little bit over time, depending okay. on the community you're in. Thanks for the call, Rodney. Thank you very much. All right, take care. 32 after the hour, Catholic Answers Live goes to Jesse in Houston, Texas on Android app. Hello, Jesse. Hi. Hi, welcome. Oh, how are y'all? Good. All right, thanks for taking my call. I just had just a quick, just a question uh, regarding about the, you know, the political responsibility that we have around moral, you know, issues that we have going on, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, my question was, um, as a voter, um, you know, I know several voters that, they are Catholic. I mean, they say, you know, of course they are Catholic and, and they always been voting in a certain, you know, like party that supports, for example, abortion, like somebody who's pro choice and, but they're, they, you know, they're against abortion, but they actually vote for this candidate and knowingly that they are pro choice, but they still, you know, they, they think it's, it's okay, but I try to tell them that it's not. But anyway, my question is that, um, can, a voter who is Catholic, you know, is practicing, knowing me that this that this person they're voting for is pro-choice. Can they receive communion? I mean, if you know and they know that. Just yet, I think you got that's a, that's you phrased it very well and completely. Jimmy. Okay, according to a uh, memorandum that was written in 2004 by then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who's now Pope Benedict, there can be situations where one can vote for a pro-abortion candidate, not because he's pro-abortion, but in spite of that fact. And in those circumstances, if they apply, then uh, then one could go ahead and receive communion. One wouldn't be uh, put out of, of full communion with the church and unable to receive communion. On the other hand, he went on to say in the memo, if you're, do, if you're supporting someone because they're pro-abortion, then no, you shouldn't be uh, receiving communion. Now, uh, that gets into a larger question of whether of what those situations are, and that's something that people have different opinions about. Um, personally, uh, I think that people in this country too lightly excuse themselves from the duty of opposing abortion. Abortion is the political black hole issue of our time. It outmasses everything. You just look in, at the number of deaths that are involved with abortion compared to anything else, and there's simply no comparison. There's like a million and a half children who are killed every year in America through abortion, and nothing else that I'm aware of comes close to that. So I think that we have an extremely strong duty uh, in America at present to oppose abortion at every level. And uh, even though hypothetically there can be situations, for example, you know, suppose you have 
two candidates, one of which is morally certain to win an office. One of them supports abortion. Another supports abortion and homosexual marriage. Well, in that circumstance, as a way of limiting the damage done to American society, you could use your vote to vote for the person who is merely pro-abortion and not also in favor of homosexual marriage. Uh, so hypothetically, such situations exist, but we should not lightly presume that we are in such a situation, and we should not lightly presume that other issues stack up to abortion in terms of their gravity. Jimmy, the way Jesse's friends phrased it, well, I, su- I don't support abortion, but that sounds a little bit like they are in that uh, sleepwalking crowd. That, well, I just it's certainly don't see a, the contradiction. It's certainly a huge danger signal. Yeah, Jesse, how is that, sir? Yeah, I mean, I was just wanting to make sure because um, that question's been brought to me once, but I was kind of like unsure because I know that if if you consciously know that one is and one is not pro-abortion, then you should vote for the one who's not pro-abortion, the one who is pro-life. <laughs> I mean, the one who publicly says. I am pro-life, while the other one is pro-abortion. Good, good, it's, a good, would, it's a good follow-up, Jesse. Yeah. What if the other one is totally incompetent with no political experience? Well, there, it's 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 a situation that has to be judged individually. Um, there, you know, it, it all, it's also easy to come up with candidates who have no practical chance of winning office, or if they do, they'll be a disaster. You know, like let's say they'll get us into a nuclear war mm-hmm. or something. Well, okay, in that case. You know, one might not vote for the, that candidate or one might abstain from voting for either candidate. Mm-hmm. Um, if you'd like to read what then Cardinal Ratzinger and now Pope Benedict had to say on the subject, go online and uh, and search on the phrase worthiness to receive communion. That's the title of the memorandum that he issued that was circulated uh, privately to the U.S. bishops, but then came to public attention. Jesse in Houston, thanks for the call. Yeah, they might even permit another Brady Bunch movie to be made. Wow, that's a lot, chilling, hey, A lot of things can go down. With Jimmy. Cousin Oliver, even, that would think, be horrible. Uh, <laughs> All right, from Jesse to Carrie in Brockton, Massachusetts on WQOM. Hello, Carrie. You're on Catholic Answers Live. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, Patrick. Hi. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Aiken. I, Jimmy Aiken, right? Aiken and Either Coffin. one. Either right. one. <laughs> um, thanks for taking my call. My question had to do with last right as far as um, to a person that really wasn't practicing a Catholic religion and also was in a coma where they um, were not able to, their brain was no longer functioning. But I am a practicing Catholic, and um, it meant a lot to me. I know this person was baptized, okay. and um, I wanted to know if... Um, that was helpful in any in any way that I was able to do that for her. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, Thank you so much. In terms of the question, uh, because uh, this person was baptized, it was possible in principle for them to validly receive uh, the anointing of the sick. And if they uh, if they were receptive on whatever level they could be, even in the absence of higher brain function, right. if, if they were receptive on whatever level uh, to God's grace, then uh-huh. through the administration of the sacrament, they received God's grace. Uh, that's what the church means when it says that the sacraments work ex opere operato by the by the working of the work. So the fact that you perform the rite that uh-huh. Jesus gave us means that unless we're putting something else in the way, God will make sure he delivers his grace through it. That's a promise. And so, oh, at, thank you. so as a result, uh, if, if this person had openness to God's grace, then this administration of the sacrament supplied it. Oh, great. Just, thank you so much. Carrie, just, you, Carrie, just for nomenclature's sake, you, you're referring to the sacrament of the sick, right? Not just final blessings or prayers? Because we the, oh, the that's, term, last that's, rites is, that's true. Well, mm. t- typically um, the anointing of the sick is is part of the last rites. There's also, for example, an apostolic pardon uh, that can free one from uh, uh, f- uh, from the necessity potentially to go to purgatory. Um, and there there also are other prayers that can be used. Mm-hmm. Um, I I would assume. It, correct me if I'm wrong, Carrie. That the anointing of the sick is part of what you're talking about, right? Yes, the the thing was that um, I live in Massachusetts, and this 
accident happened in Florida. So I was at the, you know, for whatever reasons, we had to drive there. We couldn't fly, and um, I had to just, you know, the hospital was able to call, Mm -hmm. like, a Catholic priest for us. So I didn't know him well. I mean, I was not in my in my area right no i asked him i asked him for last rites but he did call it anointing of the sick and we did say like prayers together and um he kept saying her name was Kristen. if you can hear me at any on any level you know and i think Mm -hmm. we went through you know i was just in such shock that it's hard to recall all of it but yeah i think we went through like some of you know do you reject um, Satan, and I, I think like all this type of right. stuff. Carrie, you know I, mean? I think we have reasonable hope to believe that that she did hear. There's so many questions we we can't have answered when people have various degrees of brain dysfunction. Yeah, and and, and even if she didn't have. Uh, you know, any conscious awareness at that time. She might have had a disposition prior to the accident or even during the accident where she opened herself to God. Mm -hmm. Um, The fact that she wasn't Catholic, you know, creates some uh, potential canon law situations. Not all non-Catholics can receive the sacraments, but in this case, the sacrament was administered, and consequently, uh, if she was open on whatever level, then uh, then she would have received God's grace. And God loves her, and you and me and Jimmy and all the listeners, Carrie. Indeed. Great, great call. Thanks for uh, joining us. It's 41 after the hour, running slightly late for our next break. When we come back, Jimmy Aiken, who will be loaded with uh, a fresh supply of Diet Hansen's premium soda, black cherry flavor, zero carbs. Take your calls, 888-31-TRUTH. We will be right back. Jimmy Aikens taking your calls now on Catholic Answers Live. Advent will soon be here. That means a season of preparation and expectation. As Catholics, it also means a new beginning of sorts in the most important area of our lives, the liturgy. On Sunday, November 27th, the implementation of the new English translation of the Roman Missal will begin in parishes throughout the United States. Yet one study found that 77% of Catholics don't realize that fact. What can you do about it? Order Jimmy Aiken's brand new book, Mass Revision, How the Liturgy is Changing and What it Means for You. As an added incentive, we've lowered the price from now until the end of the year. So order now and save. Call 888-291-8000. Log on to Catholic.com or stop by your local Catholic bookstore. The Eucharist is the source and summit of our faith. Don't you owe it to yourself and your loved ones to be informed about the changes about to take place in the Mass? Equip yourself with Jimmy Aiken's Mass Revision today. Order it at 888 Catholic.com or your local Catholic bookstore. Plus, look for the ebook version at Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. Women have made great strides in our culture, but the culture doesn't think so. Hi, I'm Teresa Tamio, author of the new book, Extreme Makeover, Women Transformed by Christ, Not Conformed to the Culture. Today's open acceptance of pornography, abortion, and contraception has objectified women more than ever. Ladies, don't buy it. My new book is full of research on a culture that affects you in negative ways. In Extreme Makeover, you'll find everything you need to see and feel your true beauty inside and out. Extreme Makeover is now available from IgnatiusPress.com, Amazon. Amazon.com or at your local Catholic bookstore. Pick up a copy and start your Extreme Makeover today. Catholic Answers, one of the most trusted names in Catholic apologetics. Call now with your question. 888-318-7884. This is Catholic Answers Live. And waiting nary a second, we skip to, in addition to Malou, we go to Aaron in Jacksonville, Florida, on 1460 AM. Hello, Aaron. You're on the air. Hello there, Patrick and Jim. How are you? Good. Great. Uh, I got a question about, um, by the way, I'm, I'm an evangelical, and this is going to be my fourth time. Wait a minute. Fifth time to call. Oh, oh and, that uh, you I, become eligible for a cash prize by Jimmy Aiken. Oh, really? I just say <laughs> that to pull Jimmy's chain once again. Whenever I can, I like to, to do that to him. <laughs> he, he how can Jimmy, all the time. How can, how can Jimmy help you, Aaron? Yes, uh, this is with regards to um, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy versus uh, Roman Catholicism. Okay. My question is, uh, why must 
I joined the Roman Catholic Church and not Eastern Orthodoxy. Okay, well, you don't have to join the Roman Catholic Church. You could also, if you want, join the Chaldean Catholic Church or the Maronite Catholic Church or the Syro Malabar Catholic Church Melkite. or the Melkite Catholic Church or the Ukrainian Catholic Church or any of the any of the more than twenty Catholic churches that are in union with the uh, with the Pope. Um, they're all equally Catholic and uh, they're all equally in union with the Pope, and so potentially you could join any of them. Now, the the Roman rite of the Catholic Church happens to be the largest. And so here in America, you're most likely to encounter a Roman Catholic parish, but there are other Catholic parishes as well. What um, one of the differences is between the Eastern uh, Orthodox churches and the Catholic Church is that, unfortunately, uh, they're not in full communion with the Pope. They, they, uh, many of them recognize him as having a special role within the church, but they're not in full unity with him. And that's a problem because the function of the Pope as the successor of Peter is to serve as the ecumenical center of the church. And so in order to be fully in union with the institution that Christ left us, one needs to be in union with him. And so unfortunately for historical reasons, that's not at present the case with the churches of the Eastern Orthodox communions. And so while they have a great deal of uh, the uh, patrimony of Christianity, both doctrinally and liturgically and sacramentally and in other ways, uh, they are missing out on a few things, uh, the most notable of which is the, is, is the lack of unity on, on the ecclesiastical level. Uh, there are some other theological differences that are common but are not necessarily – um, such that would divide communion. Um, they uh, sometimes the issues center around the particular way in which the Holy Spirit proceeds. Uh, also, you know, you don't always have uh, the doctrine of purgatory articulated the way it is in the West, but in principle, it's still recognized that uh, that the deceased can be assisted by our uh, by our help here on earth, and so there's some kind of of experience they undergo uh, commonly prior to arriving in the full glory of heaven that we can help out through the liturgy and through our prayers. So even though the term isn't used, the principle is there. And so on these various theological issues, we're so close that although um, in some cases you will have people uh, try to pit the two understandings of a particular theological point against each other, it's also possible to understand the two theologies in a way that's harmonious. And hopefully that'll be used as a basis in the future for a full reunification. But until that happens, if one is looking at the two communions and saying, should I be Catholic or should I be Orthodox? Uh, I was there. I, w- I had to face that choice myself. And for a variety of reasons, I said I need to become Catholic. And one of them is, and one of the big ones was, Catholics have the institution of the papacy. Uh, both sides agree that the Bishop of Rome has a special and unique role in the church as the successor of Peter in a special way. And consequently, if one side has that office and the other doesn't, I had to ask myself the question, which side is more likely to have been guided by God into a correct understanding of the office, the side that actually has the office or the side that doesn't have the office? And I concluded uh, that God was more likely to guide the side that actually has the successor of Peter into a correct understanding of what that office is. And so Mm -hmm. that was one of the reasons that I became uh, Catholic rather than Orthodox. Aaron, we have a tract, I believe, Eastern Orthodoxy at Catholic.com. We have some Mm -hmm. resources there. Uh, Also, um, I I wrote an article a number of years ago in our magazine called Why I Am Not Eastern Orthodox that was on our website, but because our website's undergoing some revisions right now, um, I'm not sure if it's there right now, but you might be able to find a cached copy of it on Google. It's free, though, no cash required to uh, to read it. Cached in uh, in in the electronic sense. Aaron, I hope that's a help. Oh, yeah. Appreciate Great. It. We'll be praying for Bye-bye. you. I think you'll find the water of the Tiber to be quite uh, quite warm yeah. and comfy. <laughs> All right, Aaron. Take it easy. I'll get that. Right, 49 after the hour, we go to Scott in Dallas on 9, 10 a.m. Hello, Scott. Hi. Um, I just want to tell you something. I um, 
I have a player journal that I keep, and um, for some uh, for some reason, um, one of the reasons, but I, uh, I write down um, on January first every year. I write down um, my my prayer intentions, uh-huh. stuff that I want, and people have asked me to pray for them. I didn't I didn't put Catholic Answers uh, Live down uh, and the listeners down. I have to say I can't um, help you guys out financially at this point, but I just didn't feel like my prayers were helping, but. After reflecting on that, I think I'm going to put you all in my prayer journal again. After all, well, thank you. We I, appreciate it, and we need that. it. And, thank you, Scott. And hey, also, just hey, so I'm you know, sorry, uh, just so you know, no, we're right no, at I the end of the show. Scott, we're, we're at the end of the question, my brother. Got to got to get it out so Jimmy can give you the answer, please. Yeah, I will. Um, I'm just wondering. Um, I know God gave us an intellect and a brain to use, but He also gave us the Holy Spirit. So um, my question is, how? Um, how do you use your brain, but also follow the Holy Spirit? Because it seems like those two things are two different things. Well, they they certainly are two different things. The Holy Spirit is is a person of God Himself and an immaterial, uncreated person, whereas our brains are created realities that are are part of our bodies. So, yeah, um, there is a difference uh, in terms of how to use. Uh, how to how to have recourse both to the intellect God gave us and to the Holy Spirit. Uh, God approaches people in different ways and in different situations. Uh, he may give you, uh, it in some circumstances, hypothetically a private revelation uh, that would tell you you know what you need to know. On the other hand, that's not the normal pattern. Most of the time, uh, we don't normally get conscious, big, obvious private revelations. And so uh, what I recommend that people do is that you pray about the subject, you talk to the Holy Spirit, you say, please guide me, uh, help me find the right information I need to make a decision, help me apply uh, my intellect that you've given me in the best way possible so that I can arrive at a conclusion that would be pleasing to you. And that's, that's the conclusion you would have me come to that, uh, you know, the best, the best answer. And then, uh, pray about it. Think about it. How long you research it, how long you have to do all that will depend on the magnitude of the decision. Uh, obviously, it, you know, for bigger decisions, if you have the opportunity, you want to study about them and pray about them more before having to make them. You know, for mm-hmm. example, getting married to someone. You don't want to do that on a whim. Uh, if it's something much less, like what movie to watch tonight, you shouldn't be devoting a lot of time to it. Um, then you just work within the limits of the time constraints you have and make your best choice and uh, trust God to guide you. Good question for spiritual director, too, on the yeah. ground. Thank you, Scott. Uh, we're going to one more caller. It'll be Claire in Fountain Hills, Arizona. Hello, Claire. Claire, uh, if you got to turn your radio down, please, or off. Okay. Hey, Claire, you have to turn your radio off, honey, okay? Okay. Thank you. Hello, Patrick and Jimmy. Hi. Um, my, my, I'm a first-time caller. Yep. I think your radio might be still a little bit up, Claire, but uh, Jimmy definitely wants to answer your question, but we're running out of time, so go ahead. My question is, did, did Mary actually die before she went to heaven? Good question. The church doesn't have an actual teaching on this. Most th- Catholic theologians in the West are of the opinion, or at least historically, have been of the opinion that Mary did die prior to her assumption into heaven. But when Pope Pius XII defined the assumption in 1950, he phrased his definition, that his infallible statement, in a way that left that question open. And he simply said that at the conclusion of her earthly life, Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven, but he didn't say whether she had died prior to that or not. Thanks for calling, Claire. Claire. Thank you. Call back any time. Okay. All right, take care. Well, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for joining us this hour, sir. My pleasure, Patrick. Thank you for being such an excellent host. We'll see you in the hallways. Okay. Not before then. Enjoy the rest of your Hanson's beverage. I will. Thank you. All right. Coming up next, hour two, author, staff apologist, all-around good guy, Jim Blackburn. We'll take your calls in the second hour. Ivan, Rich, Bill, Olga, Monica, stick around. Jim Blackburn will be uh, arriving over the hill like the rescuing uh, cavalry in a few minutes. 888 truth is that toll-free phone number. My name My name's Patrick Coffin. The show's name is Catholic Answers Live, and we will be right back. Hour two, coming up. Thank you. 